Hi everyone, my name is Faustine Chan. I'm the Business Innovation Manager for BBB serving the Pacific Southwest. So welcome. Um, we have a couple of people around the US from Yuma, San Diego here. Um, if you wanna chat in the chat box, let us know where you're from. We'd love to hear from you. This webinar is being recorded, so if you do miss any part of it, it will be posted online at events.bbcommunity.org. Um, if you do have questions throughout the webinar, please type them in the chat box and also the Q&A. We will answer them um, probably at the end or throughout the webinar, um, just depending on what the question is. Um, we have a great speaker today, um, Ryan Karkenny, um, is a member of the Computer and Technology Crimes High Tech Task Force. Ryan primarily handles cases involving the internet and cybercrime, as well as cases where technology is an instrumental tality of the crime. This in includes account takeovers, these are kind of scary, <laughs> account takeovers, network breaches, among other things. He's been a deputy district attorney with the San Diego District Attorney's Office since 2009, and he has also received extensive training in the area of digital forensics and digital evidence presentation. So please welcome our speaker today, Ryan. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining me today. And the topics that we're going to be discussing include cybercrime, cybersecurity, um, and they're topics that I, I never have enough time to go over everything I want to. So I'm just gonna kind of jump right into the presentation right now. And I'm gonna start um, my presentation up and we'll kind of just jump right into it. Now, um, Again, I wanna say good afternoon to all of you tuning in from wherever you are. Uh, I hope all of you are staying safe, sheltering in place, staying productive, and of course, staying sane. Um, in you know, this, this crazy, unprecedented time, um, the only way we're gonna get through it all together is by taking care of ourselves and by taking care of each other. Now, um, uh, again, thank you for the wonderful introduction. As you've heard, I'm a deputy district attorney and I've been with the County of San Diego DA's office for uh, about 12 years now. I've handled every type of case uh, from murder to molest, uh, DUI, uh, theft-related crimes, fraud-related crimes. Um, but I am now a member of the CATCH Task Force, the Computer and Technology Crimes High Tech Task Force, and we do focus on internet and technology-related crimes. Um, so again, the topics that I'm going to be going over extensively today are cybercrime as well as cybersecurity, or what I like to call digital hygiene. Um, and these are the topics that move my fund meter, right? I love discussing it. I love go going over it, figuring out um, what we can do to be safer. And I love doing these types of talks because oftentimes when I'm speaking to the community members, um, it's because a crime has already occurred and we're trying to figure out how we can do something after the fact, whether that be prosecution, getting back uh, lost or stolen money, um, you know, things like that. But this is an opportunity for me to talk to all of you before the crime occurs and hopefully prevent a crime from occurring. Um, as you've heard, I'm gonna be uh, talking about the cybercrime digital hygiene and uh, part of my presentation I will be focusing on uh, cybercrime and cybersecurity while working from home as it relates to you, your business, small business, um, and specifically some COVID-19 and coronavirus uh, scams and fraud that are becoming more and more prevalent. Now, before I get into that, I always like to show a, uh, a short video clip about my office, the San Diego District Attorney's Office, and it's, it's not that long, but I think it does a fantastic job of explaining what my office does and includes some areas which you know, the public might not be aware of. So I'm gonna go ahead and play that video now, and then I will see you right after. There's been a lot of attention on district attorneys lately and the prosecutor's role in the criminal justice system. But you might not know all the things the DA does, the limits on the DA's power, and the ways the DAs have already been changing their approach to prosecution in recent years. The DA's number one responsibility is keeping our community safe. We do that in three basic ways that we call the three Ps. Prosecute criminals who break the law, work to prevent crimes from happening in the first place, and protect and support victims of crime and make sure their voices are heard. When you think of the DA, you probably think prosecutors. While that's a big part of our job, the power we have to hold criminals accountable is carefully defined by the law and our ethical responsibilities. 
When someone's arrested, we carefully review the facts and the evidence. We can only file the criminal charges we believe we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Our job includes protecting the rights of the innocent, as well as those we charge with the crime. Then, the case moves through the justice system, which provides checks and balances and accountability. Public defenders, criminal defense attorneys, and judges all play a role in how the case will resolve. Prosecutors alone don't determine a person's punishment if they're convicted. That's up to a judge and jury once we've proved our case. Our goal is always fair and equal justice for everyone, but also justice that's smart and reflects the needs of our society and the will of the people. As prosecutors, we also have the ability to give people second chances. That's why we work with special courts that steer people away from jail, still hold them accountable, but get them the help they need to break the cycle and stay out of jail. Help like mental health treatment, finding a place to live, or kicking a drug or alcohol addiction. We also support restorative justice programs that help offenders understand the harm that they've caused to a particular victim or community. That's one way we prevent crime, but there are lots of others. We work with youth to help them make good choices and stay in school. We support programs that help people who are coming out of prison to find jobs. And we let the public know how to recognize and report crimes like child abuse, elder abuse, sexual assault, and human trafficking. The third big part of our job is protecting and supporting victims of crime. In a typical year, the DA's office comes into contact with thousands of victims, and we help them in lots of ways. We help get them emotional support for the trauma they suffer from having a child or loved one murdered, or the emotional pain from a violent crime like rape. We help victims even when we can't file charges against the person who hurt them. We sometimes even use therapy dogs to help them testify in court and tell their story. Our we do all of this on behalf of you, the people. And we're accountable to you and to the laws of the state of California. Those laws are always changing to keep criminal justice priorities in line with changes in society and technology. We embrace reform, but we'll always work to make sure change happens in a way that continues to keep our neighborhoods and you safe. So in moving forward, I want to emphasize that today isn't about scaring people away from using technology or their internet for both your personal life as well as in your business. Um, but the point is to make sure everyone is a bit safer out there, right? And the internet is a wonderful place, right? Ever since Al Gore invented the uh, internet way back then, we've become uh, increasingly dependent on the internet, right? Everything from how we socialize, how we consume entertainment and media, uh, how we do our banking. Um, and with that has come the ability uh, to make it easier for people around the world to access each other as well as their services. Um, but of course, uh, as with anything that is created um, for a good purpose, there is often a, a dark side, right? And when talking about internet security and cybercrime, I like to analogize about something that we all understand and, and think about it you know, in its simplest form, right? And when thinking about internet security, it's not that uh, people can't understand, it's that people just aren't used to looking out for the dangers and aren't used to seeing what is a potential threat or danger out there, right? Now, in front of you, I have this, um, you know, scary, dark, abandoned alleyway, and at the end of it, we have our ATM machine, right? And most of us have the common sense to know they're not going to go down that that alleyway and you know make a, a large cash withdrawal at the end of the at the end of the alley because there are dangers involved, right? There there could be a robbery, you know, those types of things. Um, cybersecurity is is very similar to this, right? And uh, we need to start thinking about the technology that we that we love and we use every day uh, as kind of a potential dark alley. And we want to be able to put potentially um, look out there and see what could be a danger to us or our business, right? So um, the dark side of the internet uh, includes lots of things, right? Fraud, threats, stalking, uh, human trafficking, narcotics, extortion, malware, uh, and of course, Right. Um, in all seriousness, though, the, the Internet is used globally to commit fraud, right? Um, anyone who hasn't heard of the Nigerian print scam um, hasn't been using the Internet any time in, in, in the past you know, several years, right? Um, there are uh, 
prolific hackers from other countries that are also trying to compromise our businesses, our government infrastructure. Um, it's commonplace to see cyber bullying, cyber threats um, in, in schools with children. Um, you know, and then I get, of course, human trafficking and, the, and those types of things as well, as, as well as the sale of uh, illicit narcotics and controlled substances. Um, you know, we get complaints from these types of cases all the time. And, um, you know, internet crime and the dark side of the internet, it is a significant issue. The um, FBI website, which is related to their Internet Crime Complaint Center, the IC3, um, their most recent statistics that they put out is an estimated loss of over $12.5 billion from October 2013 to October 2018, and that looks to be to be going up. Now, these are the, the latest data points that we actually have. They haven't finished tabulating anything more recent, but um, in, in my industry, we believe this is actually a low number for lots of reasons, right? Um, a lot of times, um, fraud and scams, sometimes they go undetected for significant periods of time. So if you don't know about it, obviously you're not gonna report it. Now, the other side of it is that we believe that these types of scams are severely underreported as well. Um, oftentimes people are embarrassed, you know, they fell for that scam, they clicked on that link, they, they basically willingly gave up their personal identifying information, their banking information, and you know they're responsible for the loss that they sustain. So they're afraid to report. So this two point, uh, excuse me, twelve point five billion dollar loss, it's actually probably low. I want to uh, point out that um, you should always report any of these types of crimes, right? Um, officers in our jurisdiction, California, and I'm sure there's similar uh, statutes and rules in place in other jurisdictions, are required to take identity theft reports. That's uh, Penal Code Section 530.6 in, in California. So um, you should always report any type of scam, suspicion, fraud, um, when someone's trying to perpetrate it against you or if it, or if it has actually happened and you are a victim. Now, um, this is normally my uh, audience participation uh, type of uh, part of the program. Uh, you can feel free to type in the chat box if you'd like, or I'm just going to go through it. But this is a uh, part of my presentation that I call, Can You Spot the Risks? So I'm going to be putting up a series of photographs, and I want you to look at it. And if you're not going to type, just kind of think to yourself, what are the security, uh, cybersecurity risks that we have here? I'm starting off with an easy one, right? We have a keyboard with our sticky note that says password one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, don't get me wrong. When my suspects do this and we get a search warrant for their house and we're trying to get into their computer and they have a sticky note right next to their computer with this signage on it, I love it because we're gonna get in there, right? Unfortunately, uh, if you're not a bad actor and you're trying to protect your stuff from a bad, ac bad actor, this sort of practice can also be detrimental. When thinking about cybersecurity, uh, we need to be thinking about fundamentals, and that starts with a password, right? Um, for one, two, three, four, five, six, and password and admin have been the number one, two, and three passwords used for the past several years. I think ever since we started um, keeping track of and taking these polls on what is your, what type of password you use, um, it's very important one that you choose a complex and unique password, and I'll talk more about that later. And it's also important that you store your password somewhere safe, right? Now, you may be thinking, I'm working from home right now. I can keep my sticky note on my desk. No big deal. This, the, the thing that signs me into my work server or my work computer or my personal computer. But keep in mind, uh, you know, home burglaries, unfortunately, happen. And if someone takes your laptop, your work computer, if you have a sticky note on it, under it, next to it, uh, or anywhere near it that shows what the password is, you're gonna be in trouble because not only are they gonna be able to steal the physical laptop or the, the physical computer, they're now gonna have the tool, uh, the information necessary to get into it and do way more damage, right? So that was kind of an easy one. Let's go to the next one here. We have our uh, mailbox outside of our house. The little red flag is up indicating that there's mail in there and ready to be taken away. Um, all right, can you guys uh, think to yourself what could the potential risk be here? Well. The insecurity here, um, you know, not only does that little red flag indicate to your postal carrier that, hey, there's mail to be taken, it is also signaling to your would-be thief, your, you know, drug addict that is looking to steal your identity, steal your personal identifying information, steal your banking information, your, your company information, um, and use it for no good, right? So, um, you know, normally what I say is if you're mailing something at your house, you should actually try to go into a post office and mail it there if you can instead, right? 
Um, you know, nowadays with sheltering in place and everything that's going on with the coronavirus and, and the pandemic, you know, we, we can't necessarily do that, right? So the, the next best option is going to those big blue mailboxes and mailing it from there, right? That can be good and it is better than just sticking it out in your mailbox. But, you know, we had cases where um, thieves have actually ripped those big blue mailboxes out of the concrete, taken it to an offsite location and, and opened it there and stolen the mail, right? Um, there's also thieves that have come up with pretty um, interesting ways of fishing the mail out um, using household items. So the big blue mailbox isn't foolproof either, right? Now, until we're not working at home and until uh, the sheltering in place is over and we're, we're through this pandemic, going into the post office for our personal and business mail, that might not be an option, right? So uh, what I would say is this is, Postal carriers and service, uh, the services generally have set times when they're coming around. They have patterns, right? Um, you should try to pay attention to that and put the mail out just before you think your mail carrier is going to come, right? What that does is, you know, it's still going to be out there for a little bit, uh, but what it's doing is it's limiting the vulnerability. It's reducing the vulnerability, the amount of time when it's just sitting out there and can be stolen. Um, when it comes to cybersecurity and uh, these types of issues. It's always about security versus convenience, right? If it is uh, extremely convenient, it's going to be less secure. And if it's more secure, it's going to be less convenient. And when we look at all these different things and topics that we're discussing, that's the general rule that we have to keep in mind. Um, another thing is um, if you can get a mailbox that locks so that incoming mail, when it's dropped from the postal carrier, can't be taken out by someone unless they have a key, that's also a way that you can safeguard um, you know, your mail at home. All right, let's look at this. We have a blank check, some um, financial information documentation, and then a garbage can, right? Um, can we spot the risks here? Well, you know those uh, credit card uh, checks that come in the mail that are blank and just ready to be written out and, and cash or used? Well, those are risks. Those are financial uh, security risks, right? And your garbage can, the garbage in front of your house that you're putting out there is also a security risk. Um, what we need to have, especially in the age of working from home, and even if you're not working from home with all of your personal information that you have at home, you need to uh, have a cross-cut shredder of some sort. If you already don't have one, you know, try to order it from Amazon, eBay, Smart and, Fi uh, Smart and Final, or Staples, or you know, those types of stores, because you wanna make sure that any bit of uh, documentation or paperwork that has any sort of personal identifying information, financial information, banking information, credit card information isn't just crumpled up and thrown in the garbage or um, ripped up and thrown in the garbage. You want it to be shredded and put in the garbage so it can't be rebuilt. Um, there's been numerous times that my team and uh, other law enforcement teams have uh, executed search warrants uh, at a criminal's home or, or hotel room and you go into the bathroom and the, uh, the hot water's on causing steam and, and guess what they're doing? They're taking your ripped up personal identifying information, banking information, and they're re-piecing it together on the mirror using that steam to stick it on, on the mirror. So there are uh, you know, would-be criminals out there that want to get into your garbage and do get into people's garbage and steal your information in that way. So cross-cut shredding is very important when working from home and just dealing with your personal information while you're at home as well. Now this next one um, is a, a, a typical email scam, and we're going to go uh, more into that a little bit later, specifically the business email scam. But what we have here is an email, um, it's actually from a few years ago, and they've only gotten more sophisticated. But this is a scam where they're trying to get you to click on that link, on that blue link that says HTTPS uh, colon forward slash Bank of America, right? And um, it looks pretty good, right? It looks like it, you know, they have the Bank of America symbol up top. They have the, the fine print 2014 Bank of America Corp at the bottom. But whenever you're dealing with email, you want to stop and take a, take a breather, even email, text, those types of things, and take a look at what you're really looking at before you click on anything or take any action. Because there are often telltale signs that this is a fraudulent email that's trying to hurt us, steal something from us, steal something from our business. Now in this one, the from line, which is um, highlighted at the top, you can see it says Bank of America, that looks okay. But when we actually look at the email address, the domain name, that at comcast.net, that's a bit suspicious, right? Because Bank of America is a big enough company uh, where they would have their own uh, domain name. 
they're not going to be using a generic Comcast.net domain name. So already, red flag, you can probably disregard this email, send it to the junk, report it as a phishing scam, or just delete it, right? But you definitely don't want to click on it or re reply or engage. The next thing under that you see is highlighted, it says two undisclosed recipients. Well, that means this is just going out to a bunch of different recipients, right? The more phishing emails they send out, the more fish they're gonna catch, right? So if it's actually um, to you, it's gonna be to you and not to a bunch of undisclosed recipients. The next thing you see under that is where it says, dear member, it's being pointed out with a red arrow. Um, you see member should be capitalized. So these types of emails that are from, um, you know, scammers, would-be scammers. Um, they often have typos, misalignments, incorrect formatting, things of that nature that would normally be screened by a large corporation. You can see the next thing that's circled that says, please sign into. There, the font is kind of messed up. There's, there's bolding on it. The sizing is wrong. Again, these are all telltale signs. That this is some sort of a scam email. Now, the link that they want you to click on is next, right? And that's highlighted in blue. It looks like a, a normal link says bankofamerica.com. That looks great. I want to click on that. It's going to take me to bankofamerica.com, right? Wrong. Just because you have a link in your email or in a text that says one thing, it doesn't mean that that's where you're going. In most modern browsers or email clients on your computer, you can um, either uh, right click or hover over it. And you can see it's being hovered over in this example. And a box will pop up. And this one is actually showing you that it's directing to um, a bit a link shortener. It's not going to bankofamerica.com. It's going somewhere else that you don't know where that is. And these types of scams can be very sophisticated where they'll take you to a website that looks like a Bank of America website. But in fact, you're now entering credentials for your bank account into a criminal's, uh, you know, into a criminal's website. And they might even redirect you to the Bank of America site putting in your credentials for you so you never know that you've been scammed until after the loss has already occurred. So these are some of the telltale signs you want to look out for when you're looking at emails, uh, especially that involve personal identifying information or financial information. Now let's jump into um, the, the cybersecurity part of it, what we can do, some of the biggest vectors of attack. Um, and I like to actually call this computer or digital hygiene. Now this is an actual photograph of, um, from, from a while back when we executed a search warrant uh, on one of our defendants and by his computer was all, it was, it was disgusting, right? Um, when I say computer hygiene, no, I don't mean, you know, your workspace, although while we're working from home, that might be how some of our workspaces look right now, right? And I get it. Um, but I'm talking about what we do as far as safeguarding our accounts and our information. Now I said before, um, it always comes down to security versus convenience when it comes to digital security and um, cyber crimes, right? Let's talk about some of those notable attack vectors. And the first one I want to talk about is Wi-Fi um, or unsecured connections. Um, now that we're, uh, I generally focus on using unsecured connections out in the public. So at Starbucks or McDonald's, they have that free Wi-Fi you can use and sign on to, and it's convenient and it's great. But generally when you're out in public um, on an unsecured Wi-Fi that you can just log in without a password or anything, or that other people are logging on to, other customers are logging on to with a password, you don't want to be doing any um, anything that is involving, uh, you know, banking or personal identifying information. Now, if you're just browsing a website or something, that's fine. But you don't want to be entering credentials or bank website information or financial information on a public Wi-Fi. Um, that can be unsecure. Um, if you have to do that when you're out in public, um, you want to use a VPN or what's known as a virtual private network. That's a bit of software that you can install on your phone or computer. I a lot of times represent, uh, excuse me, recommend NordVPN or ExpressVPN. And what that does is once it's turned on, installed properly, um, it will actually encrypt the information leaving your device and that's incoming into your device. So anyone on the same network can't steal that. I'm not gonna go too in depth on VPN right now, but um, I do wanna talk about Wi-Fi at home as well, because I know a lot of us are working at home right now. Um, and again, um, a lot of times with digital security, it's always about the basics. So if you're working from home, you're working on important documents, um, you know, financial documents for your business, you want to make sure that the Wi-Fi network you're on is secured. And you want to make sure that it's using WPA2 technology uh, at least, right? There's even WPA3 now, which it's not necessary at this point. You can still use the WPA2, which stands for Wi-Fi Protected Access. Older routers and older protocol was WEP technology, which has been cracked. Now, 
Most um, Wi-Fi routers you're getting from your ISPs, your internet service providers, come with um, an encryption already on, security already in place, a WPA2 security already in place. Um, so you know when they get it to you and, and they tell you what your SSID is, that's the thing that's being broadcast that you're looking for in the list of Wi-Fi. And then when you click on that and ask for a password, that's your password credential, right? Um, if you're doing that, if you had to do that at one point to get onto that network, that means it's secured, right? And most routers um, from you know bought privately or from your ISP, those come with security already on. But you want to make sure and double check, and you can call up your ISP and discuss it with them. Or if you're more sophisticated, you can access it through your web browser and just ensure that you have the security on and that it's WPA2 or greater. Um, with regard to VPNs, I do want to point out one other thing is that a lot of them are free or have a very small monthly fee or even a one-time fee, and it can be very helpful. As I kind of pointed out earlier, email is another large vector for attack, and that includes malware, phishing scams, ransomware. Ransomware is where someone sends you an email um, that either has a link to something or an attachment. Um, and then a piece of malicious software or malware gets installed on your system, and what it does is it locks the user out of their system and then says, if you want to get back into your system and see your data, get access to your data again, you have to pay me some you know, amount of money. A lot of times it's Bitcoin nowadays or uh, some sort of other cryptocurrency because it's uh, harder to trace. But in any situation, you want to be very careful about emails that are coming in. You want to make sure you actually know who the sender is, make sure it's legitimately from the center. But sender by looking at all those clues that I, I talked to you about earlier. And um, unless you know the sender and you're sure who the sender is, you definitely don't want to download any attachments, click on any links, or install anything that's coming through from an email unless you're absolutely sure you know the sender and it's safe. Uh, because again, this is one of the largest vectors of attack. Um, also in, included with what I said is uh, the blind links. And that's the term blind link is when there's a link in an email and you don't really know where it goes just by clicking on it. You have to hover on it or click on, right click on it and check the properties to see where it's actually taking you. Because a link that says one thing, again, can be taking you somewhere completely different, right? The next thing I wanna to talk to you about is um, antivirus software, right? And um, if you're connected to the internet with a computer, a, 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 a tablet, you know, a laptop, some sort of desktop computer, you need to have some sort of antivirus program running. Um, it's gonna minimize your risk. Um, I like to go with uh, first party, there's lots of third party solutions, right? McAfee, Norton, uh, you know, Avast. There's lots of third party solutions. They generally use the same virus definitions and those generally come out weekly because as a new virus is discovered, that it will be added to the definition and now your system needs to it has the knowledge to look for that specific virus, right? So it's not only important to have uh, an antivirus installed and turned on, it's important to make sure that it's updated regularly as well. You know, every month, that's better than nothing, but, you know, ideally you're checking weekly to make sure that your antivirus is up to date. And a lot of them have automatic settings now that make it easy where it says check automatically for me. So those are all good things that you, you need to uh, take care of. Now, with these third-party uh, software, if it's for your company, um, you know a lot of them uh, are for pay, obviously, and they do have enterprise or business licenses, meaning you can get some pretty good deals when you're buying it for three or more machines. So if you're interested in any of these uh, bits of software, you can ask them about enterprise or business pricing if it's not already posted on, the, on their uh, website. I like to keep things simple a lot of times. And nowadays, um, first party solutions are fantastic. And what I mean by that is solutions that are from Microsoft, if you're on a Windows device, um, solutions that are from Apple, if you're on an Apple device, and they are actually fantastic. They're already installed. You just need to make sure that they're on and updated. Windows 10, um, has a built-in option. Uh, it's their Windows Defender antivirus. It also has a firewall installed that keeps uh, malicious actors from accessing your network and your computers from outside. Um, Macintosh has their gatekeeper and their file vault system. But what, whatever you're doing, you want to make sure that these are up to date. Okay. Now, in addition to making sure that your antivirus is up to date, another key thing, and it's pretty basic, is making sure that your OS or your operating system on either your phone, tablet, computer, that that is up to date as well. 
So on iPhones, it's, or, uh, it's iOS. On uh, iPads, it's iPadOS. If you're on a device from Samsung, LG, Google, it's gonna be the Android operating system. And they regularly push out updates and you wanna make sure that you're actually updating it. I know it can be a pain when you see that little red badge and it pops up telling you it's, it's time to do an update, but it is important to do that uh, as soon as you can, right? Um, you can wait for the dust to settle, but by the time they've actually pushed a notification to you, it's been out for a while and other people have already installed it. It's been uh, tested significantly and it's generally safe to install those updates and better than not installing the update. I know it's inconvenient to do it, but you gotta keep those devices up to date because they include not only new shiny features and the new emoji that you wanna get to, but they also include updates to security and backdoors and zero days, which um, have been discovered by the companies. Uh, a zero day is an exploit that's present uh, in the software, um, you know, right at, right at the get-go, and they have to be passed with some additional software at a later time. In addition to making sure that your operating system, whether it be iOS, Windows, Mac OS, uh, Android, be updated, you wanna make sure that the software you're using is updated as well. So if it's Office 365, you know, the good thing about a Chromebook is that it's constantly being updated for you automatically. So that's a good thing about um, Chromebooks, they, they are updated automatically. Um, let's go ahead and jump to the next one. The next area of vulnerabilities for online accounts or personal accounts, and that is um, when you use weak or recycled passwords, okay? Passwords are the first line of defense for cybersecurity. It's the first area of prevention and some of the easiest things you can do to make sure that you and your accounts are safe online, that your information is safe online. Best practice is to use a complex, uh, complex and unique password, right? And I'll, dis I'll discuss what that means in a minute. Um, but when we say, um, you know, the thing that I like to, I, like, I have a special quote that I like to use to help people remember how important this is. And here's the quote, right? It is, passwords are like underwear. Don't let people see it, change it very often, and you shouldn't share it with strangers, right? And those are all true, okay? Um, you don't want to really let other people see your passwords. Um, you do want to change them periodically, and you definitely don't want to share them with anyone, let alone a stranger, right? So always make sure that you're being safe with your passwords. Now, what I mean by a, a, a complex password is, Generally, uh, you want it to be at least 12 characters long, and you want it to include, uh, it want it to be case sensitive, that's upper and lower case letters. You want it to uh, include numbers as well as symbols, exclamation point, you know, hashtag, those types of things. Um, now, every website and service has their own rules around creating passwords. Some of them have eight characters at a minimum. Some of them have 20 characters as a maximum. You wanna look at what their um, restrictions are or their rules are, and you want to make sure you're creating a password that is within their rules, but is complex. It's hard enough so that uh, a computer system, which, which are very powerful nowadays, can't guess it very easily, right? And that's, that's the risk why you need a, a, a complex password, okay? You also want unique passwords for every single service that you're using, okay? And this is very important. And what I mean by unique is you don't want the password you use for Facebook to be the same password you use for Google to be the same password that you use, uh, you know, for your bank site, right? Because if one of those is breached, if one of those is hacked and the hackers discover what your credentials are for that website and service, then guess what? They have the keys to the next service and they're going to try the next service. If they find out what your Gmail password is, the next thing they're going to hit up is your banking site or your Yahoo site, you know, or so on and so on. They're going to keep testing it. And odds are, unfortunately, most people recycle passwords. They're going to get lucky and get into more services than just the one that had the, the hack or the leak, right? Okay, so when, um, when we're talking about uh, unique passwords, I want to recommend using what's known as a password manager, right? Um, and a password manager is a service and a piece of software that will generate random, long, strong, unique passwords for each service that you use, and it will store it for you. And then you just have to remember one, what's known as master password, which again, you wanna make strong and unique. And then whenever you're on a website or logging into an application or something, um, the software that's installed, that password manager will prompt you, do you want me to enter the password for this service? Um, LastPass is a great one. They have a free service as well as a small monthly fee service if you want some more premium features. I think the premium service is about $3 a month. And when you think about that cost, 
$36 a year or whatever it is, um, it's very minimal for the amount that you're saving in potential data loss, financial loss by not using complex unique passwords. If you're an all Apple person or company and you're using an iPhone and a Macintosh laptop, Mac desktop, uh, you know, uh, other iDevices, um, it comes with iCloud keychain built in. You can use it, that is uh, a very secure method of storing. There's also Dashlane, one password. Um, N-Pass is another one. Uh, some of them are free, some of them are one-time fees, some of them have a monthly fee. Uh, and I think they're fantastic. I, I do recommend using a password manager. Um, if it's one that's been vetted and that's good, and you can generally see if you're downloading the app from the Google Play Store or the App Store or their website, you can look at reviews. If they have a lot of reviews and downloads, it's generally gonna be trusted. You can trust iCloud, Cheechkane, LastPass, um, Dashlane, one password, they're all great, and they've been vetted by independent security researchers. Uh, you may be thinking, well, if I just have one master password and someone gets a hold of that, well, don't they have the keys to the kingdom? Yes, that's true. But again, it always comes down to convenience versus security, okay? And this is one case where the convenience of, you know, it's gonna be really hard to keep track of yourself, all the potentially hundreds of passwords you need in our, in, you know, the year 2020, Every single service we use has a password, right? To have them all be unique and different is, is hard, and remembering them is even harder. And keeping track of them in a secure way is hard as well. Uh, the services that I'm recommending, they all, they never store your master password, so um, you know, they just keep it a, a hash of it, and the password's stored only on your devices. So even if they get hashed, uh, excuse me, hacked, um, they're not gonna, the, the bad actor, the hacker, isn't gonna be able to actually get your master password. So that's something to definitely think about. Now, if you're not gonna use a password uh, manager, you got to always try to use what's known as a passphrase. And um, I have a passphrase up here. The Chargers are the worst team in football. Now that they've moved out of San Diego, I can, I can say that. Um, but what we're gonna do is take this passphrase and let's say that's what you want to be your passphrase uh, for websites. That's a long thing, right? But what we can do is break that down into a little, a little uh, passphrase for us, right? And the Chargers are the worst team in football can become for the purposes of our password on a website or service. TC, notice they're capitalized, the at symbol, uh, TWT1F. And if you notice, TC, that's the Chargers, R, instead of an A, we're using the at symbol, the worst team, TWT, and then for N, instead of I, we're using a one, and football, we're using an F. Notice we're also using, uh, we're using upper and lower case, we're using symbols, the period, the at symbol. You just wanna make sure that whatever your passphrase is, it's something you can remember. And then you're going to remember the little you know, tricks that you did to create this shortened passphrase. So you have your passphrase now. Well, I thought, Ryan, I thought you told me to make it unique to every single website. That's true. So what you can do is modify that passphrase for whatever website or service you're using. So here I have a couple examples. If it's Facebook, you're going to use your, uh, the Chargers are the worst team in football. Then you're going to add some brackets, FB for Facebook, right? Or if it's Google, you're gonna have your same passphrase, the Chargers are the worst team in football. Then you're gonna add Goog for your Google services in the brackets there. And you can do this for every single service and then still have a unique, safe, complex password, right? All right, so the next area or vector of attack that we generally see is using insecure websites, right? And there are, in this particular realm of what I'm talking about, two types of websites. There are secured websites and there are unsecured websites. So what do I mean by that? Well, a secure website is a website that is using encryption where any data you're entering or uh, receiving is being encrypted before it gets sent out into the internet, right? An unsecured website is out in the clear, the information's out in the clear, the information's not being encrypted and it just gets sent away. Anyone snooping on that internet line uh, can uh, see your data. So how do we know if we're on a secure or an unsecure website? Well, nowadays, it's 2020, most websites that you want to be secure, uh, eBay, you know, financial websites, your banking websites, they're gonna be secure. And how would you know? Well, browsers are designed in a way so that you can actually, again, see little cues and know that you're on a secured website. So let's go ahead and look at the address bar. That's the bar that's green on the top of this slide. And this is uh, in Internet Explorer. I know it's a uh, internet browser that a lot of people use, but most of the browser makers, Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Microsoft's Edge, that's our new browser. They have these same similar features so that you have clues to know whether or not the website you're on is secure or unsecure. In looking at the address bar, which I've highlighted here in red, and I'm gonna blow it up so it's a little bigger for us to see. Notice that the website is HTTPS, right? And that's fantastic, right? That S is symbolizing, it's letting you know that this is a secure website. 
If it's an unsecure website, like the University of Florida website below on the slide, you're gonna see there's no S indicating it's secure. Every browser I've seen also shows a lock when you're on a secure website, showing that this is a secure website. Um, notice again, the University of Florida website, and I pulled this off a couple weeks ago when I was updating my research, they still don't have a secure website. And again, they're showing it to you by um, no S, uh, no lock. And another great thing that I liked about Internet Explorer and a lot of other modern browsers do it nowadays, which I would recommend being on a, a browser newer than Internet Explorer. They do have better security features. If you want to stick with Microsoft, Edge is generally built into products now. Um, but what they did was they made the um, address bar that we're looking at here turn green when the page was finished loading, again, showing you you're good to go, it's green, it's a secure website, and it would not turn green. In fact, it would turn pink in some cases um, if the website was insecure. So again, PayPal is a good example there that we see those same clues, uh, but that's a way that you can tell that you are um, browsing a secure website. If you are uh, browsing a website that's unsecure, no big deal if you're just reading and browsing, but if you're entering payment credentials, banking credentials, personal identifying information, you don't want to do that on a website that is not secure because anyone out there on the World Wide Web could potentially be snooping or stealing your data. All right, after insecure websites, uh, the last portion of this that I want to talk about is a lack of data backups, right? And this is important for a few reasons, right? Failure to have your or your company's data backed up, and if you're you know, a bigger company and you have an ITD department, they should have this all figured out already to some extent or another. But if you don't have your data backed up, you're vulnerable for a couple reasons. One of them is if you have computer or network failure or server failure, potentially you can lose all of your personal data or your business data, right? But another issue when it comes to cyber attacks and security is that if you do happen to fall you know, victim to a ransomware attack where they've taken over your system, well, guess what? If you've got all of your data backed up, you can say, I'm just gonna wipe my computer and restore the data. You don't have to worry about unlocking the computer. You can just wipe it, start from scratch, and put all your data on. You've already beat the ransomware without having to do anything else, right? So that's why it's important to have backups. Best practice is to have multiple backups, on-site, in your home or at the office, and off-site in the cloud or maybe somewhere else. And of course, the reason is you know, probably obvious, but if, it's, if you only have it in one location, if there's some sort of catastrophic uh, incident, like a fire, a flood, a theft, and that backup is gone, well, guess what? It's gone. But if you have it on site and a duplicate off site, you're still safe, right? Now, I do want to point out one other thing. If you ever do fall victim to ransomware, I want to point out you should never pay the ransom because once they know they've got you on the hook, they're not going to leave you alone, right? They might give you the key to unlock it once, but they could potentially relock it remotely. And once they know they have someone that's going to pay, they're going to keep going back to that well and keep trying to get as much money as possible. So never pay ransomware attacks. With regard to local and offsite backups, including cloud backups, there again are always gonna be trade-offs. Um, sometimes it comes down to cost. If it's an online service, a backup service like Carbonite uh, or any of those types of services or using a Google Drive or Microsoft OneDrive or a Dropbox type of service, um, generally you're gonna have some sort of monthly recurring fee. Whereas if you just buy a large hard drive to store at home, or off-site somewhere, um, that's gonna typically be a one-time fee. So again, you're going into um, you know, the cost-benefit analysis of what you wanna do to keep yourself safe. Best practice would be to have an on-site backup where you bought a large hard drive, you're backing up regularly. That's again important, same with, um, as we just talked about with updating software and virus definitions, you wanna update your backups, make sure you back up regularly on-site, and do an off-site backup. That's best practice. All right. Now I wanna to talk to uh, the issue at hand and that's challenges of working from home, uh, specifics about threats in the age of COVID-19 and the coronavirus. You know, we're all trying to adjust to the new normal and to stay productive. Um, here's a little clip that I'd like to show you that I think we can all relate to as we've been trying to stay productive and work from home. All right, so I, I, again, I think we can all sort of relate uh, to those, those types of things happening when we're trying to work from home. Um, so let's get into it and, and we'll just talk about it kind of quickly. Uh, but 
I like to think about it like what's old is new again. And in all the reports we're getting and, and the incidents that are being reported to us and the research that I've done is basically we're seeing some of the same types of scams that you would see otherwise, but with a new wrapper where people are trying to capitalize on you know what's going on right now. And anytime there's a crisis of any sort, um, criminals, would-be bad actors are gonna see it as an opportunity for vulnerability, an opportunity to prey on people you know, and make them victims, right? So I want everyone out there to be aware of the COVID-19 scams that are happening. In particular, um, you know, there's the economic uh, stimulus, the payments, right, that are coming out, uh, the economic impact payments that are gonna be uh, directly deposited into your accounts or sent by a paper check. And think about that, right? Now we have these thieves and they know, guess what? A large portion of America is suddenly, you know, infused with hundreds of dollars from the government there's a lot of ripe victims out there, right? So uh, important to note that the IRS has stated that they're gonna deposit your economic stimulus check directly into your account via direct deposit from the last time that you filed your taxes and, and did, got your tax refund, right? Um, there is at the IRS, IRS website, which I'll have at the end of the slide uh, presentation, you can go and check on the status of your check, but I want everyone to know that the IRS will not be reaching out via text email on the phone in person to collect data from you or to verify your account and banking information in order for you to get that direct deposit. We're seeing the scam actually happen and unfortunately some people are turning over their personal identifying information or their businesses information and that's just not going to happen. The IRS is not going to reach out to you. Okay, You can go to their website, check on the status. If you haven't received a tax refund in the past, you can put your banking information uh, directly at the IRS website. Similarly, um, paper checks aren't gonna be going out anytime soon. So it's gonna take another few weeks for them to be made and printed out because it's coming out from the treasury, right? And um, so any paper checks you're receiving in the mail, they're fraud. Um, you know, so you need to make sure you know that. Um, we're seeing IRS impersonations, again, in person, telephone, text, email. You need to be aware of those scams and just know that it's not gonna happen that way. Uh, be aware. And if someone engages you with that, just delete the message or don't respond. There's, there's no point uh, in, in getting involved with that. Now, one of the old scams that we're seeing and that are becoming more prevalent now as people are sheltering in place and trying to do social distancing is one that we've seen in the past. And that's uh, the old real estate, internet real estate scam. So what there'll be is a, a, a listing for a home that's legitimately on the sale and our bad actor will scrape the image, scrape the data for that property, and then they'll put it on some sort of internet site other than where the listing was at, uh, Craigslist, whatever, and they'll put it as a property for rent, right? And they'll use the same wording, the same pictures, and they will be more than happy to not meet with you in person, collect first and last month's rent via Western Union or Venmo or whatever without you ever doing a walkthrough of the apartment, talking to someone on the phone. And guess what? Now the victim has turned over all this money that they're never going to get back for a property that wasn't even really uh, for rent, but instead it was for sale and some you know, thief has used it as the, you know, the, fog, the, the, the their scam bait, right? So if you do have to do any sort of uh, rental agreement or things like that uh, via internet, you want to make sure you actually talk to someone over the phone, especially if you can't do a walkthrough or meet in person via social distancing. You know, the more actual interaction with people that you can have to verify things. You can also do reverse Google searches, right? If you're looking at a property for rent, do a reverse Google search. Make sure it doesn't come up on any of your real estate websites as a property that's actually for sale and not for rent. Unfortunately, we've seen that far too often. And for renters out there, as with everything else in life, if the deal seems too good to be true, it probably is, right? Business email compromise, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but I wanna talk specifically about this. This is one that someone on my team actually received. And with these business email compromises, it's gonna be directed to you as a representative of your business. And the hallmarks of these are always urgency. There's always some urgent need to act in the email, asking for you to transfer some money, transfer some information, something, right? Um, and uh, you need to take a breath, actually read the email, see what's happening. We had one recently, a, a very large company uh, got an email from a quote unquote vendor that was saying that their account was $2 million overdue. So of course they, they freaked out. They didn't want to you know, lose that vendor, lose the, the stream of uh, commerce. And 
Uh, of course, the email said, uh, we have a new uh, routing number as well, a new bank account we need you to transfer to the money to instead of the old one, we're changing things up. Uh, they sent over $2 million. Um, luckily, that was caught early, and it, it appears that we are going to be able to get most of the funds back. But whenever there's some urgency in the email like that, take a deep breath, read it, make sure it's who it's actually coming from, what they're actually asking for, is it legit? Look for those hallmarks I pointed out earlier. In this particular one, to one of my teammates, our domain name is catchteam.org, at catchteam.org, team with an M. In this one, you can see it's actually coming from someone who has changed the domain to look like Catch Team. It's really catch, but instead of team, it ends in RN, which if you just look at briefly, looks like an M. But guess what? It's coming from a bad actor, right? So you want to take time, take a deep breath, don't start transferring money around or information without really looking at what you're doing. All right. Um, the other types of uh, scams and, and vulnerabilities we're seeing is new technology or new to you technology, right? And of course, some of the big ones are things we're using right now, right? Zoom, Skype for business, Google Hangouts, Google Meetup, FaceTime, you know, things that uh, these digital tools that we maybe never used before or maybe never used extensively. Um, what you want to do um, and whenever there is a, a, a huge ballooning of users, there's gonna be issues identified. There's gonna be weaknesses identified. No software has ever been written perfectly without any bugs. There's always gonna be some bugs to fix at some later time, right? And something like Zoom, the last uh, data that I looked at, they went from uh, about 10 million active daily users to over 200 million active daily users. So think about that explosive growth in use and all the cracks that would start to show, right? Now, I don't mean to uh, single out Zoom, but I know it's been very popular, so that's why I'm gonna talk about Zoom a little bit in particular. But what you wanna make sure is that um, you know wh about what you're using, right? So before you download some software, make sure you poke around their website, make sure it looks legit. If it's recommended by a friend, talk to them about it, how long they've been using it. Then you wanna read up about it on the website. Um, you know, then you can download it, install it. Before you actually start using it, make sure you poke around the settings. What kind of security settings are in that software? Um, you know, what's, what sort of other things can you look at in the software to make sure you understand how to use it? Practice, do a practice call before you actually just jump into it. Um, on this topic, let's look at one more clip. So that's just some of the examples of the really uh, exponential growth in scams related to COVID-19 and the coronavirus. Um, we're seeing fake organizations pop up. I, uh, in checking recently, there have been thousands of domain names, internet names registered every single day related somehow to COVID-19 or coronavirus, and a lot of them are being used to try to scam people. Uh, fake organizations being made, emails, text messages, calls promising cures, vaccines, masks, um, you name it. Um, you know, they were talking about that ra ransomware, which was actually um, a bit of software that made it onto the Google Play Store. That's the store that you download uh, applications from on your Android phone. Apple's been doing a pretty good job about filtering out any sort of scam uh, COVID-19 software, but some actually made it through on the Android Google Play App Store. And it, um, instead of, uh, you know, downloading a, a COVID app to let you, that's showing where people are being tracked that have it, um, it would install uh, an application known as COVID Lock, and again, it would lock out your device and ask you to pay them $100 in Bitcoin. Um, again, scams can come in any form, websites, email, text messages, phone calls, or even in person. Um, just to point out how prevalent it is, even NASA has seen an exponential jump in malware that their personnel is getting as they work from home. Their um, systems that uh, block out malicious uh, software from coming in and also try to block their employees who have clicked on it from going out um, has doubled since work from home has started. And you know that just goes to show you even really smart people that work in NASA are falling for these phishing emails, clicking on them, and then you know in a lot of cases NASA software is blocking them before they're going out to these malicious sites. Um, I talked about zero day ex exploits earlier. Zoom has been really good about fixing software vulnerabilities and software issues. They've been releasing patches regularly. That's why it's important to update your software. But just recently, um, there was an offer uh, trading uh, zero day exploits for Zoom for half a million dollars. And that's again a vulnerability where someone can get into Zoom, hack into it, access your credentials, maybe get into your calls. Um, as I'm sure you might have heard at this point, there's been something going on called Zoom bombing um, or credential stuffing attacks as well. 
And that's where, um, in the case of Zoom bombing, if you're not using the safety features and the security features, such as a password for the room, using the waiting room security feature, um, anyone can just join the call. And there's websites out there that um, they will teach people how to generate the numbers uh, that you need for a Zoom meeting. So Zoom bombers are coming into all different kinds of meetings. Um, there's been AA meetings and NA meetings where Zoom bombers are coming in saying very nasty things uh, related to drugs, talking about you know racial slurs, um, showing pornography and inappropriate pictures. So if you're using Zoom and you want to make sure you're familiar with how the software works, make sure um, you're using, uh, I think by default they change it now where Zoom meetings uh, do have some sort of a password and that you want to make sure whoever's hosting the meeting is using their waiting room feature and is only admitting people that are supposed to be in that meeting. Um, there's been also um, on the on the web, uh, reissuing uh, or reusing credentials has been happening as well. And what has happened is that um, hackers on the web have been selling people Zoom credentials, again, their uh, username or their email address and password on websites for fractions of a penny, um, several millions of users, right? And what it is, is, is when people reuse credentials, let's say there was a target hack or a target breach, um, a lot of times hackers will get those and they'll assume that people are reusing passwords. Again, the thing I said not to do earlier. And so what they'll do is they will test it on Zoom and guess what? It works on Zoom too. Once they've cross-referenced that these um, credentials that were found in another hack, an older hack, um, they will then build a database and sell it on a website. And again, our information, our personal identifying information uh, are being sold right now. Uh, they found it. Uh, uh, for fractions of a penny on, on the dark web as well as the open web. Finally, some specific uh, tips for working from home and some safety precautions um, other than the foundational things that we've discussed. You know, you want to be extra vigilant about what you're clicking on, emails, links, etc., things like that. Consider using a VPN even at home, especially if you're accessing work infrastructure. Um, if it's a larger company, uh, you might want to talk, and you have an IT person, you might want to talk to someone about whether or not a VPN is being used if um, critical information or secure information that should be secure is being sent from your home to the office or the office's servers. You want to, again, keep all your software up to date. That includes operating systems, browsers, applications. Um, if you're doing uh, emailing, messaging, if possible, if you have a personal device and a work device, you want to try to actually compartmentalize those devices. Try to only do work uh, business on your work device if you have a dedicated work device. And try to keep your personal um, information and personal business on your personal device if possible. It's a, good, um, it's a good compartmentalization to have. Also, you want to be careful when you're transferring files from home to work servers. I, I discussed that a little bit earlier, making sure it's a secure connection. And um, if you do have an IT and IT security protocol, you want to make sure that you're always following those. Uh, and again, I would be remiss if I didn't mention 2FA, also known as two-factor authentication. A lot of websites offer that. I'm not going to get into details today, but I, you know, Google, um, Amazon, a lot of vendors like that offer two-factor authentication. It's something you might want to look into uh, at a later time once you have all the basics covered. Um, with that said, I know we're, we're uh, quickly running out of time here, and I, I think we wanted to see if there was a couple minutes to take any potential other questions you might have. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and put this resource uh, resources slide up, and uh, these are some things you can take down, either screenshot the screen or take a photo of it, and these are places where you can report uh, suspicions or if any fraud or crimes have occurred. These websites also have some additional great information with regard to digital hygiene and cybersecurity. With that said, I want to thank you all for tuning in today. Um, it's been my pleasure. Stay safe, uh, shelter in place, take care of yourself, take care of your loved ones. And I hope everyone, uh, you know, we, we're going to get through this together and we're going to be uh, safer and better for it, stronger for it on the other side. So thank you again. Thank you, Ryan. Um, looks like we had a couple of questions. Um, I know you, looks like Carol talked a little bit about um, the Zoom software. Um, she has, let's see, do you have any um, insight about a checklist for WebEx, MS Teams, and EasySoft? So 
th there are checklists for WebEx, uh, which I believe is a Cisco product, as well as Microsoft Teams and EasySoft. And what we're talking about here are all different types of clients or services that do the same thing as Zoom, right? They're video conferencing or video chat platforms and pieces of software. Um, unfortunately, as I sit here right now, I don't have a checklist that I can direct you to immediately, but um, a Google search of Microsoft Teams security features or WebEx security features, it's gonna bring up, and I've done it, so I know that they're out there, it's gonna bring up checklists that you can look at or feature lists with regard to security that you're looking at. And that will often include information about whether your call is going to be encrypted end to end, how it's encrypted, and you can get, uh, you can get pretty deep into the security features other than just using passwords for your meetings and things of that nature. Um, something that Carol, I believe, also pointed out is using um, virtual backgrounds. And that's what I'm using here. I did create a virtual background with my offices as well as my team's uh, catch symbol. You see it there? Um, and that does help with security because now uh, if you're, especially if you're talking to someone that's outside of your organization or something like that, um, if you have uh, sensitive information in your home, maybe even pictures of your family, if it's that type of security issue, or uh, let's say you're in a company that tries to uh, keep future products secret or um, you don't want bank credentials that might be sitting on a desk behind you visible. If you use a virtual background, which you can get into, especially on Zoom, um, and Microsoft Teams has virtual backgrounds, you might want to consider using that. Microsoft Teams also has a background blur feature as well. You can click that, and what it'll do is it'll blur out everything that is not the person. It actually works quite well. Um, so those are, those are some good points um, by Carol. Thank you for tuning in, Carol, and thank you for the, uh, the tips as well. Great, and then we had a question that was submitted through email from Barbara. Um, she's a small business owner and only has a few employees. Is there a checklist that I can download that my employees can go through so they can protect themselves while working at home? Right, um, well, uh, I'm joking, but uh, the checklist is this presentation, right? I know you they, they might have to sit down and watch it for an hour. It is gonna be available after the fact by a recording, so you can direct them to that. I think it would be a good, op a good opportunity. And after the fact, they can fast forward if you know they don't wanna listen to a particular uh, part of it. But there are definitely some websites, and perhaps I uh, can talk to Faustine after the fact about um, putting up some of those resources, some links uh, to some good checklists. But again, um, just Googling internet security, you're gonna find some fantastic articles. You just wanna make sure that you're going to news sites that are reputable. So uh, something like ZDNet, uh, Engadget, um, TheVerge.com, uh, as well as your traditional news outlets like CNN, USA Today, and things like that. But I can, um, I can work on some of the resources that I have, and maybe get those to Faustine so she can make them available to um, our BBB uh, people and partners. Um, I do want to also point out there's a lot of misinformation going on, uh, not just with regard to cybersecurity, but how it relates to COVID-19 and coronavirus. Um, the uh, conspiracy theory about coronavirus and 5G, there's absolutely no scientific data whatsoever to create any sort of connection. You want to make sure, and it relates to cybersecurity, that the information you're getting, make sure your source is from a legitimate website, a legitimate news source, because there is a lot of misinformation going around as well. Great, thank you, Ryan. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have in our chat box in the Q A. Thank you so much for taking time um, out of your busy day to share this useful information. I hope everyone found it very useful. And um, if you miss any of the part of the presentation and you need to review it, um, it will be posted on events.bbcommunity.org. Um, thank you very much again for attending. Um, please stay safe out there and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe.